The world's two AI superpowers are locked in a competition that's making everybody less safe. And today, on July 4th, America's birthday, I want to talk about the strategy shift that we could choose to make that would keep everybody safer. The current AI race is not helping anybody, but I want to propose an th alternative solution that could actually work. Let's start with how we got here. Every transformative technology has triggered a similar response to what we're seeing right now. So in some ways, it's very understandable. Both Washington and Beijing are reaching for Cold War era playbooks. Export controls, technology denial, zero sum thinking. There's an assumption that the other's AI dominance would mean defeat for the other power. There is a narrative that artificial superintelligence is right around the corner, that it will be what you would term a singleton world, which means only one superintelligence will develop. And if that's the case and it's truly super intelligent, suddenly all of this Cold War thinking starts to make sense. The problem is this. We don't live in a singleton world. Even Sam Altman has admitted he doesn't think anymore that we're going to only have one super intelligent AI or only one generally intelligent AI. We're going to have multiple. Do you know why? Because this technology is extremely easy to proliferate because it's built on the back of the internet. And what did the internet do? It took the cost of cooperation between people to zero. In the nuclear age, which was what the Cold War was built on, we had physical materials and clear boundaries. You had to move physical materials around in order to construct any kind of nuclear weapon. In the space age, we had massive infrastructure. You could track progress through rocket launches. In the AI age, everything spreads at internet speed. There are no borders. Yesterday's strategies fail at dealing with tomorrow's technology. And that is what we're looking at with AI. And that is why I think the Cold War frame is incorrect empirically with the technology that we have today. There is a paradox with containment. When we put export restrictions on another country, we intend to slow progress, but instead, because necessity is the mother of invention, we trigger efficiency breakthroughs. DeepSeek achieved GPT-4 level performance with 90% less compute. Innovation thrives under pressure consistently. We have 450,000 plus open models on Hugging Face. Open AI models. Anybody can grab them. Researchers from both nations routinely publish together. That is, by the way, a fantastic thing. That is a great thing. Knowledge flows like water across national borders. It flows like the internet. And performance gaps over time are narrowing, not widening. Mary Meeker made that point really brilliantly in her large deck that I summarized, where she talked about the fact that effectively over the last two years, the competitive difference between Chinese models and American models has disappeared. There's like a one or two percentage point difference in performance. It's not that big. Meanwhile, the world continues to adopt AI at a terrifyingly fast speed. ChatGPT famously hit 100 million users in 60 days, but that's old news now. They're on track for a billion, 10 times that number this year. What we talked about in the Cold War was changes that took decades, things that took a long time to adjust. It took decades for nuclear weapons to proliferate. It took decades for great power relationships to change. With instant global transmission, with half a million open models, with the speed of intelligence growth that we're seeing, none of those old ways of thinking work. They just don't. And I get it. Everybody has a legitimate concern. From an American perspective, AI could be used for authoritarian purposes. It could be used in military applications. There could be technology transfer to other countries that could be uh, enemies of the state. Values alignment between AI systems is a real concern. From a Chinese perspective, technology embargoes feel a lot like containment. They feel like exclusion from global AI standards. Security vulnerabilities from foreign AI become a real concern. And economic competitiveness is something that they don't feel like they can trade down. So both nations in their own world have legitimate concerns. The question is, does the current approach address any of these concerns for anybody or does it just create new risks? I would argue that it just creates new risks because it locks us into a competitive mindset. Uncontrolled AI will not recognize borders if it transpires. Cyber incidents from a misaligned AI will cascade globally. And by the way, I am actually more concerned about things like large-scale cyber attacks that cascade globally than I am about something like Skynet. 
bio risks if that were to transpire would affect the entire human population. Economic AI shocks, if that were to transpire, would ripple worldwide. This is the same way that Chernobyl didn't stop at borders. If an accident happens to one of these technologies, it's up to everybody to cooperate to solve it. The 2008 financial crisis, it went global immediately. I remember where I was. Similarly, in 2020 with COVID, it went global right away. AI risks will move faster than biological risks and even faster than financial market shocks in certain situations. What I want to see is a cooperative framework that will enable both superpowers in AI to work together to converge around common standards that contain systemic risk. And I want to go further than just saying we should do that and actually propose some principles that we can talk about. And I know, I, I have no illusions. I do not think people in government are watching this video, but it's still worth us as a society talking about, a global society, because everybody shares risk when AI is not well managed. So core principle number one, graduated engagement. Compete where values and interests diverge, sure, but cooperate where existential risks converge. And we have existential risks with AI, even if we stop short of a Skynet scenario, that are still worth working on cooperation for. Build trust through little tangible steps and verify technical cooperation. These are things that, like, we can choose to do. Sure, there are areas where there's natural competition, economic applications, national security systems, governance models domestic implementations. I get it. We don't have to try and fully align there. But there's also areas where we can reasonably cooperate. Preventing autonomous weapons proliferation. That seems like something everybody would have an incentive for. Biodefense AI safety protocols. That seems reasonable. Financial system stability. Everyone has an incentive to keep the financial system stable. And critical infrastructure protection. We can work on a common core of risks that we would want to contain and agree on a framework for cooperation to address those. We could choose to do that. So what are some practical steps that we could imagine? Can you tell I worked at the Model United Nations? I was such a nerd as a kid. Anyway, joint risk assessment. Both nations AI scientists could identify shared risks. They could focus on technical issues, not politics, somewhat similar to the climate science panels. The focus would be building common understanding. Incident communication channels, technical hotlines for AI anomalies, preventing misunderstanding during a crisis. We had hotlines during the Cold War. We don't have an AI hotline. Why don't we have an AI hotline? What about parallel safety standards? They don't have to be identical. They don't even have to, they don't even have to be fully interoperable. They just need to be interoperable enough that there's some sense of common safety measures. International aviation is a good example. We have different airlines, but common safety standards. Each nation implements it in their own way. We need a similar sort of approach with AI. It would be helpful if we could also agree, and this is probably a little bit of a stretch, but could we agree on research transparency zones, places where everybody could come together to research, to learn about AI, to investigate AI safety. It benefits everybody, it's supposed to threaten nobody, and it keeps competitive advantages as something that can be worked on together and sort of diffuses some of that great power tension. Third party verification, Switzerland, Singapore, someone who's known for being neutral could act as a validator. Technical verification could occur and both nations' secrets could be respected. I get that I'm talking at a little bit of a high level. I am not going to the level where I'm talking about specific systems because one, if I knew about them and I talked about them, I'm sure I would get in trouble. I don't know about them. And two, they're evolving very quickly. And so it doesn't make sense to actually go to the 10,000 foot level and talk about specific technical systems when they're all being built. It is more important to talk about operative principles because at the moment, the operative principle seems to be competition. And in this case, I think it was more rational to be competitive when the technology had a different footprint. Nuclear proliferation and competitiveness and mutually assured destruction, that was all the language of the Cold War. And it kind of worked. It held the world in tension, but it held it stable. I do not think this equilibrium is stable. If we have competition under a fast moving technology footprint, it's not a stable situation. And that is dangerous for everybody regardless of where you live. And so I think it's more productive to have a more cooperative stance. And so my ask is that we think less about how we can maintain a competitive advantage in a way that's zero sum and more about how we can start to think about 
establishing practical frameworks that show that we can build trust step by step. It's essentially an ask that we return to the idea of America as a place where we can establish a sense of human flourishing that survives the AI age. Not that I'm saying the founders or the framers anticipated the AI age. Heck, most of us didn't anticipate the AI age 30 or 40 years ago. There were only a few that were visionary, but now we're here. And now we need to think about how these long-term principles apply in this new world we find ourselves in. And in a sense, that's all our jobs, because as a species, it's our job to figure out how we establish human flourishing with AI for the next 500 years, for the next thousand years. And if we're going to do that, it means getting this part right right now. It means getting the birth of AI right. And so my thinking on July 4th is let's be cooperative about the birth of AI within reason. I know we're going to be divergent as great powers on different things, but as much as we can be cooperative, I think everybody will benefit because this baby AI is growing up really, really fast. So that's my July 4th reflection. Great powers have competed through history, but even the nuclear weapons story taught us that some risks require coordination. AI presents even like even greater shared dangers because it's moving faster. And I do believe that we can compete to some degree while cooperating to prevent real disaster. The choice is smart rivalry or destructive rivalry. We can be rivals like brothers, right? I have a brother. <laughs> I like him a lot. We're rivals in a lot of fun ways, but we're also friends. We also have each other's backs. And even if that's not a perfect analogy, the idea of a smart rivalry is something that I think you can take away from this. Happy July 4th. Cheers.